Assalamu alaikum. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, but at the same time, it's a challenge because to be between uh, your very hungry selves and your lunch, it's not a good place to be at. But I'll try to be very brief. And I thought that, you know, if before my uh, formal lecture, which is going to be very brief again, I will just uh, share with you some pictures that will be the change of mood and maybe a little bit more bearable than another dry lecture. So, uh, us rheumatologists are very cool. Uh, you probably, uh, you know, figured out from all the terminologies we use, the names of the medications, I mean, look at it. And by the time you are called on for consultation, oh, sorry, I didn't take my mask off. So by the time you're called for a consultation, it is um, nobody knows, has a clue of, about what's going on. So we are basically thinkers. And if someone asked me why I'm a rheumatologist, so that, that was one, not to undermine the scholarliness of any other of our colleagues. They are, they are equally uh, respectable, but you know, I think we think a lot. We are thinkers, and that's why. So that is why I'm here, and uh, my husband, who's a gastroenterologist, is uh, working and uh, probably on call. So anyways, thank you so much, Dr. Tafazul, the rest of the organizing committee, uh, for uh, inviting me. It always gives me an uh, excuse to come to this wonderful city. I really want to uh, commend uh, you guys in healthcare in these very difficult times. This was a picture that was shared earlier during the pandemic, you know, on, on social media. And this is my alma mater and Mayo Hospital and all the healthcare workers are uh, being uh, saluted by the law enforcement. So that, that, that is very heartening. And I think the way the pandemic is managed here in Pakistan is really, really remarkable. Um, January of, uh, actually January of this year, numbers that were shared by Dr. Faisal Sultan was that there was a 50% rate of vaccination among adults more than 12 years of age, which is remarkable. I am from, um, you know, a country where vaccines are available, widely available from the get-go, where they are free, and yet the state I'm representing, the state I practice, it's uh, very heavily read uh, Trump's country and our vaccination rates are, I think, less than 30 percent, which is we are probably third from bottom. So I really feel good about these numbers about Pakistan. And again, another very heartening picture. This is what I did last night. And that's why I said thank you for letting me uh, have the pleasure of uh, coming to this beautiful weather of Lahore in February. And despite all the precautions, mitigation measures, I had to make this trip. मैं इन ट्रिप्स को कहती हूं कि ये ज़ियारतें होती हैं और इबादत की तरह की जाती हैं। So every time I go, I have to go to have some faluda, and this is what we did yesterday. Few other colors of Pakistan and of Lahore, uh, specifically where I, you know, um, had the best of the times. I still have to do this. I wanted to do this for this conference, but I has not substantiated yet. This is also our Lahore. And uh, I wanted to share, you know, uh, my respect for two names here, Dr. Abdus Salam, Professor Abdus Salam, our Nobel laureate, our first Nobel laureate, and then Idi Saab. And this picture again, you know, although this is Karachi, not Lahore, but this is Pakistan in a bigger picture, Idi Saab is being saluted by a common man like me, and he's saluting back. So let's, let's remember our heroes and uh, let's always um, pay our respect and tributes to them. This is my other hat, what I do, and why, why I said that rheumatologists are the coolest people, on, uh, at least in the medical profession. And I know some rheumatologists, and uh, Dr. Tafazul, I'll inshallah bring him with me next time. He's a guitarist, he plays uh, music, so he's also in practice in Illinois, so he'll be here. I write poetry. This is my book, got published in 2018. And um, very, um, I'm very honored that uh, Professor Tafazul has, is going to give me a chance to recite some poetry later. Thank you. This is my other hat in the times of pandemic um, in the office. So let's get back to the very brief talk, which is So where is my next set of slides? 
close this one. So, uh, you know, this, uh, my topic is treatment of rheumatic disease following known SARS-CoV-2 exposure in, in the context, context of active or presumptive COVID-19. And these are obviously the guidelines of American College of Rheumatology which um, I have practice and have to practice accordingly. And you know, for, for here, these are guidelines, but I thought I would share. Uh, you may say we are, uh, I'm, you know, this lecture is being late to the party because we are already managing, but these are the questions that are still being asked, at least in that part of the world where I practice, and I'm sure here also. The, this is bread and butter rheumatology. I am a uh, practicing, uh, rheumatologist so i would be sharing you know the experiences you can you can go read more details about it but these are the questions that patients ask other doctors ask do i get the vaccine i am on this biologic do i need to stop the biologic what is going to be the effect of my immunosuppression on uh, you know covid so these are very very general principles what to do with your rheumatoid uh, arthritis patients and other patients who are on immunosuppression during the times of pandemic so uh, for, for practical purposes, as far as disease modifying agents are concerned or DMARDs are concerned, you can basically, uh, um, sulfasalazine NSAIDs may be continued throughout in, in a patient who is COVID positive. And also, I will come to the later to the, to the more detail about this, but um, even, do, even with severe um, COVID-19, these can be continued. Hydroxychloroquine and other immunosuppressants, including cyclosporin, mycophenolate, morphetail, and azathioprine, and non-IL-6 biologics and JAK inhibitors should be stopped temporarily and pending two weeks of symptom-free. So if your patient calls you with uh, saying that, you know, I'm COVID positive, do I need to stop these medications? General rule is yes and then you have to be off these medications for a period of two weeks after the symptoms um, resolve and which which again is you know the recommendations over there changed to the quarantine is now only four to five days after exposure and um, in in mild cases of course so i always tell them keep do hafte after you know your covid um, um, has become symptom free now this is after exposure and pretty much uh, same for presumptive COVID-19 also, that all these uh, biologics and uh, DMARDs have to be stopped for only for a couple of weeks. And um, the only patients you'll be very, very careful and tell them to stop the ant non-steroidal anti-inflammatory disease are the patients with severe respiratory symptoms. Uh, the NSAIDs had a controversy initially when we started with the COVID pandemic. We were telling NSAIDs to, everybody to stop NSAIDs because they may increase the risk of severity of COVID-19. But now we know that that was not a right claim. So it was rolled back and now it's only for severe respiratory, lower respiratory tract involvement that you stop the NSAIDs. And IL-6 receptors are treated a little bit differently because we did find that um, the IL-6, which is by the name of Ectemra over there, is actually helpful in patients with endothelial injury and the cytokine storm and all the pulmonary involvement. So those recommendations are different. We are using, we're still using actually IL-6 inhibitor as uh, the treatment of severely ill hospitalized patients in the United States. So you uh, obviously you talk to the other decision makers, the CCU, ICU physicians, and other treating infectious disease physicians because it's a coordinated care over there. And uh, IL-6 receptors may be continued. So among the biologics, among, among the uh, uh, non, including the non-biologic DMARDs, the IL-6 can be continued. What, what name does the IL-6, uh, is the IL-6 available here with? I don't know that. Ectemra? So that can be continued. So when do you reinitiate the treatment after COVID-19? Again, seven to 14 days, so two weeks. Just remember two weeks, but that again is um, for patients who are mild with mild or no pneumonia and treated in the ambulatory setting or self-quarantine. So in general, mild patients, and they can restart within seven to 14 days again of symptom resolution. 
And for the patients who have a positive PCR test uh, result for SARS-CoV-2 but are um, symptomatic and now we know that, you know, there, there's so much about COVID-19 that we don't know. And in fact, uh, rheumatology, um, uh, people didn't know much about all the biologics and their effect and now we know that we, there is a long COVID uh, syndrome also and there are so many manifestations that overlap with inflammatory or autoimmune disease. There can be full-blown flare of rheumatic disease uh, triggered but on the other hand there can be new patients also but then we don't know we'll find down the road with, by doing studies whether these newly diagnosed in auto inflammatory syndromes and uh, are, are were they triggered you know by covid-19 or was it just a coincidental finding so this is again when you decide about reinitiating the treatment the factors to remember or to consider are the severity of the disease and staying in conjunction with other uh, you know, treating physicians and uh, the, you make a decision case-to-case um, -case basis. Ongoing patients, um, in patients with stable rheumatic disease, these immunosuppressants, biologics, JAK, JAK inhibitors, and this is ongoing treatment. So once you have resumed, is there any reason to roll back anything or reconsider treatment? And the recommendations are that all these treatments can be continued. and. Um, uh, including IL-6 receptors, which um, um, including patients with GCA with the indication of IL-6 receptor. Osteoporosis medications um, like denosumab may also be um, extended, but we were prolonging the dose interval on those medications. So instead of six months, we would do eight, um, eight uh, every eight months. And then on reclast, it was uh, instead we you can you know prolong it to from a year to one and a half year. Some rec um, considerations on treatment of SLE. When to if if you diagnose a new patient with SLE, give them hydroxychloroquine like you would have given otherwise. And uh, the only uh, patients where hydroxychloroquine has to be given with more caution are again patients who are um, hospitalized and patients who have cardiopulmonary uh, decompensation because we know of the cardiovascular effects of hydroxychloroquine, um, especially in patients with the prolonged QT interval, so on and so forth. So those are the only patients where you will be considering not to start hydroxychloroquine right away. Because I'm mentioning hydroxychloroquine because for a rheumatologist, hydroxychloroquine is just like, you know, giving out candy because some, some would call it um, more of a feel-good medication where we feel good and sometimes you don't even know what's going on and you start them on hydroxychloroquine uh, just to buy time because it's a good, a good immunomodulant and does not suppress the immune system like classic DMARDs do. So, but be cautious, we have some caution uh, with the COVID patients because it may not be as safe, especially considering if their cardiovascular involvement is there. So, uh, talking about rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic inflammatory arthritis, um, again, patients who are um, in whom the disease is well controlled with the hydroxychloroquine should be continued and when able to uh, access, including in patients with active or newly diagnosed disease, switching to a different conventional synthetic diagram, um, DMART such as monotherapy or part of combination therapy should be considered. So basically, uh, I think in this slide, it's uh, the only thing that is important that uh, for patients whose disease is well controlled with Ectemra, it should be continued and for all the, uh, yeah, the gluco glucocorticoids. So glucocorticoids are generally deemed safe uh, in patients with active, uh, initially we thought uh, glucocorticoids may not help with because we know from previous experiences with um, uh, influenza A and B and SARS-CoV-1 that glucocorticoids uh, can be detrimental in those conditions. So initially there were some, um, uh, you know, reservations about giving glucocorticoids, but anything less than 10 milligram of prednisone equivalent on long-term basis, daily basis should be fine. And... Uh, for patients with systemic or vital organ threatening disease, obviously you will take a little bit more caution with hepatotoxicity and nephrotoxicity and also in case of glucocorticoids. Um, ACE inhibitors and ARBs, 
need some, um, you know, addressing because we know because of the effect of angiotensin converting enzyme on the endoth endothelial um, receptor uh, level and um, in the cytok cytokine storm and hyperinflammatory state st status in patients with severely ill uh, patients, you know, that's, that's where we discuss that and the recommendations are continue the um, ACE inhibitors and um, ACE receptor blockers as per standard of care in rheumatic disease. And this becomes, in our uh, population, it's most important in patients with scleroderma to avoid uh, renal um, crisis, scleroderma renal crisis, and also those with SLE and hypertension. NSAIDs continue use. Exception stop in patients with severe manifestations of COVID-19, such as kidney, cardiac, or GI injury. Therapeutic um, antipyretic or anti-inflammatory effect is there, but it is better to use acetaminophen as an alternative. And appropriate caution as evidence of liver injury, obviously, with acetaminophen like it. So this I basically already discussed that um, with glucocorticoids, we did see worst outcomes in previous other uh, pandemics, uh, including SARS-CoV-1 and MERS. But now with COVID-19, that there was not any such um, um, uh, adverse effect noted in patients who were taking glucocorticoid for long periods of time. Again, this I already discussed, and this is conventional synthetic disease-modifying agents, including hydroxychloroquine, do not hold, but Keep in mind the potential for cardiotoxicity, primarily patients who have EKG abnormalities, arrhythmias like primary, um, primarily QT prolongation uh, because of, and, some, and, and keep in mind that some of the ICU, CCU patients may be receiving other medications that prolong the QT interval. So follow the protocols for cardiac monitoring. Uh, biologics, uh, immunosuppressants and JAK inhibitors, Keep in mind the risk of opportunistic infections, including serious opportunistic infection, um, and uh, herpes zoster virus reactivation, shingles, sure, uh, with any JAK uh, inhibitions, which I think we discussed at length here in previous lectures. So, um, Briefing, uh, briefly, you know, summing it up, that temporarily withhold or stop all non-IL-6 biologics, immunosuppressants, and JAK inhibitors in the context of documented or presentive COVID-19, as well as after exposure. And uh, I think that is it. That was brief. So that's basically what it is. We um, just remember the two-week interval. Just remember IL-6 recommendations are a little different. Just uh, remember JAK uh, inhibitor recommendations are a, different, a little different because of their also the risk of thromboembolism and the risk of uh, reactivation of herpes zoster. Uh, keep in mind the risk of opportunistic infections. And I would end my lecture here, and wasn't it brief and cool and, you know, good. Thank you. Thank you.